Good luck. Well, yeah. counting, Eddie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You got that thing? Rolling? Yeah, trip over right now, and that will be really good. We're going to go ahead and get started. If you can take your seats. We get started on time. Hopefully, that means we'll finish on time as well. Uh, my name is Pat Cooper. On behalf of the Omaha Bar Association, I want to welcome all of you to this 13th annual uh, OBA Creighton Law School seminar on ethics and professionalism. Uh, based on the crowd, especially on a nice day like this, uh, this event continues to be a great success, and we owe a lot of that success to uh, Scott Paul and Professor Steve Severson, who really got this, uh, this event uh, off the ground and running. Uh, you'll, you'll hear from Scott uh, later in the program today. Uh, Professor Severson won't be speaking today, but Professor Craig Dallin is here and is going to join us um, for part of the program as well. Uh, this program continues to be free for Omaha Bar Association members, and for those of you who are not members and paid $75 to be here today. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a member of the OBA, uh, talk to Dave Summers before you leave here today, and uh, you can get a $75 credit toward your membership and become a member of the OBA. Uh, you should have gotten a folder when you arrived here today, and if you'll open that up, there's a list of events, OBA events that are coming up here over the course of the next couple months. And the OBA staff, uh, was inspired by last weekend's Ferris Group Ball and the wonderful World of Wonka theme. And so they placed five golden tickets uh, in the folders. So there should be several of you who have a ticket uh, to uh, attend for free the upcoming Law Day lunch on May 1st. There should be a couple tickets for the June 11th Riverboat cruise that's being put on by the Young Lawyers Division. And then there's also one ticket bid for field day on July 22nd. That's lunch, golf, and dinner at Champions Run. So if you found a ticket, would you, would you just raise your hand a little bit so Dave can see who you are and if you can connect with them uh, before you leave uh, today? That'd be great. Um, I want to thank uh, the Creighton Law School for continuing to, to co-sponsor uh, this event with us. Uh, we have a long uh, relationship with Creighton, and for those of you that know Dave Summers well, you know that he likes to sometimes spend his free time sifting through the archives of the Omaha Bar Association, and he found just within the last week a, an example of that long time relationship between the OBA and the Creighton Law School, and it's from the Nebraska House of Delegates, uh, a meeting in 1963, which uh, referred to the formation of the Legal Aid Society uh, of Nebraska, or actually, actually the first Legal Aid Society of Nebraska, that was a joint effort of the Omaha Bar Association, the Junior League of Omaha, working closely with the Creighton Law School, as well as uh, a then recent Creighton Law grant, Colleen Buckley, uh, and the dean of the Creighton Law School at the time, James Doyle, served as the first uh, president of that Omaha Legal Aid Society. And I think uh, we'll hear from Scott, the current NSPA president, because at that same time the Lincoln Legal Aid Society was, was formed as well. So uh, obviously uh, we've had a great relationship for a long time with Creighton and appreciate their continued support. I do want to also thank uh, the Omaha Bar Association's platinum level strategic partners Lanson, Dugan, and Murray, as well as Jackson and Lewis, for their support of all of the OBA events this year. And with that, I will turn the podium over to uh, Dean Mike Kelly from the Creighton Law School. Thanks. Well, thank you all for joining us on this fine spring day to do your legal ethics CLE. Um, I, I think Dave's planning one in December uh, a similar ethics one called Ethics for Slackers. Uh, we haven't quite got it together. You are not slackers. You're here in April. Uh, you're knocking this out and we're glad you're with us. Uh, Creighton Law School is happy as always to co-host this with the Omaha Bar Association. Uh, we have had an amazing partnership, as Pat indicated, uh, from the OBA's inception. Our own inception as a law school was in 1904. 
And so this year we celebrate our 115th anniversary as Omaha's law school. Uh, and we invite you to come in and visit with us and, and chat with the students. Many of you volunteer at Judgment Court and, and take externs uh, from our school, and we want you to continue to do that. Uh, our relationship with you is vitally important to us and it's part of our mission. Uh, you will also see manifestations of our mission moving out into the community uh, more and more. Uh, our new programs in health law, poverty law, our pro bono program, uh, our immigration and refugee clinic. Uh, these are manifestations of what we do. These are manifestations of who we are. Uh, our mission calls on us to have law with a purpose. And that purpose is to make life better for people at the end of the day. That's what our Jesuit calling calls us to do. Uh, the law school uh, is and continues to thrive. Uh, we've just seated our next class of 30 students to go with us uh, this summer for the eighth year to Nuremberg, Germany, uh, to learn about war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, and genocide. This is one of our signature programs. Uh, it is a, a follow-on uh, of a visit that we had in 2011 uh, from Justice Gabriel Bach from the Israeli Supreme Court, who was the deputy prosecutor of Adolf Eichmann in 1961. He came here and helped us celebrate that 50th anniversary when Marianne Culhane was dean, and I see Marianne up front here. This was a direct outgrowth of that program. And I'm happy to say that moving into this summer, uh, we've now partnered with the Institute for Holocaust Education through the good offices of the Jewish Federation, and I think I saw Howard Epstein come in the back there, um, our students now are going to be cooperating uh, with the JCC in their educational component. Uh, not only will we have folks from the IHE come in and talk to Creighton students, uh, one of the programs that the Jewish Federation does is it takes Holocaust survivors out into the community to talk to high school students. Uh, as we have fewer and fewer survivors, they're now taking Creighton Law students uh, because our students have gone to Auschwitz. They've had the education. Uh, we're very much in the business of creating new witnesses to this event and having them tell that story. Again, this is who we are. This is the kind of thing we do. Uh, and I hope it's something that you can all be proud of as well as us. So I want to welcome you to Creighton, welcome you to this wonderful OBA event, and now turn it over to the inimitable Judge Reed. there was a switch up in the order. Um, I told Dave that it was a good thing my topic wasn't on balancing family and work because I double booked myself today. Um, so my daughters, and I truly appreciate you switching with us so I can make both events today. So I think we as lawyers spend so much time focusing on the procedural and the, sub and the um, substantive parts of our cases we seldom pay much attention to the ethical aspect of it. So, preparing for the seminar, I uh, opened up the Rules of Professional Conduct, and it dawned on me that I really hadn't looked at them since I took the MCRE back in 1993. And then it dawned on me that we didn't even have the Rules of Professional Conduct in 1993. We actually had the Code of Professional Responsibility. So I kind of went through practice with the mentality of let my conscience be my guide. <coughs> and for a lot of attorneys, I think that works out just fine. Um, for some attorneys, not so well. So um, coming out of law school, I had a seasoned trial attorney tell me that practicing law was a lot like playing poker. You're forced to deal 
with the hand that you're dealt, but a lot depends upon your strategy. And with the same hand, you can either win or lose, depending upon how you play your card. I'm not sure I really ever thought that you should analogize practicing law with playing poker, um, but I found it to be true, and I found also that some people's idea of strategy wasn't quite in line with what my idea was. Now, as a judge, I have the opportunity to kind of remove myself from the lawyer aspect, the advocacy part of it, and I get to take like a third person's view of it. Um, and I realize that not all lawyers treat the rules equally. The rules of professional conduct require us to zealously represent our clients, but it also requires us to do it within the bounds of law. I don't think any of us have trouble zealously representing a client. I mean, we all love an outcome, we're all a positive outcome, we're all slightly competitive, that's probably why we're in this business. It's the other aspect of it, the within the bounds of the law that I think um, creates problems for some people. So we do have some guidance. Oh, I went way too far. We do have some guidance um, in the rules of professional conduct, and you'll actually find those in Chapter 3, Article 5 of the Nebraska Supreme Court Rules. If you don't know where to find the Nebraska Supreme Court Rules, you find them everywhere where you find everything else on the internet. So if you go to the Nebraska Supreme Court website, up at the top, um, one of the little tabs is rules. You can click on it, and it will take you to the court rules, which include the rules of professional responsibility. As I said, the, the rules of professional conduct um, occur for conduct after September 1st of 2005. Before that, we were governed by the Code of Professional Responsibility. So if you took the MPRE after 2005, you might want to take a look because there are no more DRs and candies. The preamble to the rules um, set forth basically three responsibilities that lawyers have. As a lawyer, you're a representative of your client, you're an officer of the legal system, and as a public citizen, you also have a special responsibility for the quality of justice. The preamble also sets forth a number of general responsibilities, but what I, I want to focus on here today is, as an advocate, a lawyer zealously asserts the client's position under the rules of the adversary system. Particularly, um, there's a little more guidance in there. It tells us the principles that underlie the rules Include the, include the lawyer's obligation to zealously protect and pursue a client's legitimate interest within the bounds of the law while maintaining a professional, courteous, and civil attitude toward all the people. There's also responsibilities that are set forth in there in dealing with third persons, in dealing with clients, but really my focus here today um, is the responsibility you have when you're in front of a tribunal, whether it be an administrative board or the courts themselves. Before we get to the actual rules, um, there's some terminology that's really important. Um, belief or beliefs, it requires an, a, a supposition that the fact that you're purporting to be true is actually true. And fraud is conduct that's fraudulent under the substantive or procedural law of the applicable jurisdiction and has a purpose to deceive. And that's an important part of it, that you actually have to have a purpose um, to deceive. There's lots of language that's important. In the, in the um, rules, the knowingly is the actual knowledge and also it requires a reasonable belief. Kind of like that reasonably prudent person, except it applies to a lawyer. So what do the rules actually require? Rule 3-503.3 is candor toward the tribunal. And specifically it requires that a lawyer 
not knowingly make a false statement of fact or law to a tribunal, or fail to correct a false statement of material fact or law previously made by the lawyer to the tribunal. It also requires you, if you know of precedent from your controlling jurisdiction that's adverse to your case, if your opposing counsel has not presented that to the tribunal, you have an obligation to do so. <coughs> the underlying purpose, really, is that you as a lawyer must not allow the tribunal to be misled by false statements of law or factor evidence that you know not to be true. I'm going to skip through some of the other pertinent comments. While those all deal with um, statements made to the tribunal, there's another rule that deals specifically with truthfulness and statements to others, and that's 3-504. I just want to point this one out to you because there's a little bit of difference in the language um, that kind of creates a query. I'm not sure I know the answer to it, but just something to be aware of. So in 3-504.1, if you look at the language of that, it says that, that you as a lawyer representing a client shall not knowingly make a false statement of material fact <coughs> to a third person. And then it gives you some information as to what a misrepresentation is and also what statement of facts are. But the important part is, here's the difference between the two rules. 3-504.1a, which is the one that governs statements to third persons, only allow uh, it only prohibits a lawyer from knowingly false statements about material facts. Whereas if you go back to 3-503.3, which is the one that deals with statements to the tribunal, it's false statements of any fact or law. So the question is, do you make a misrepresentation of an immaterial fact? And it'd be okay if you make it to a third person, but if you make that same statement to a tribunal, then you're going to follow the rules. Just a difference in the language that you should probably be aware of. So, this was an example, um, and it must have made a big impression on me because it was an actual example that I had when I was in trial practice at Creighton. Uh, the setting is an attorney a plaintiff's attorney who has his own client on the stand. And the series of questions goes like this. Plaintiff's attorney asks his client, are you legally blind? Client, yes. Question, please tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury how that came to be. Answer, it was the result of an accident involving explosives. Question, when did you serve in the Army? Well, from 1990 to 1992 during Desert Storm. I mean, they're innocuous questions and answers. Nothing appears to be wrong with them. The insinuation is that the plaintiff was rendered blind by an explosive while serving in the Army. But what if the facts, as known to the attorney when he prepared his examination questions, were these? The plaintiff's blindness was the result of a fireworks accident that happened in 2002. And while he did serve, in the military, he served stateside in an administrative capacity. <clears throat> so his legal blindness was not the result of a combat. It was the result of something that happened completely unrelated. <clears throat> Is that negligent misrepresentation? Is it a fraud upon the court? Certainly the order of the questions the order was meant to create the insinuation that he suffered a war injury, purpose being to elicit some sympathy from the jury or the judge, when the facts simply just don't support it. I don't know if that's misrepresentation, I don't know if that's crafty lawyering, but if you have a defense counsel who's paying any attention, 
your client is certainly going to be subject to some harsh cross-examination. And when the fact comes out that this was not, in fact, a war injury, I think both you and your client lose a lot of credibility. So what I want to focus on really um, are some of the things that I, I see um, almost on a daily basis in the briefs that we get. And I think it's important to remember that our rules require you all, when you, when you submit an appellate brief, to make citations to the record. You cite to the Bill of Exceptions by page and line. You cite to the transcript by telling us what page of the transcript uh, you're getting your facts from. And we truly do, at least the way I, I operate. We have one of those really big monitors. So I'm able to open up two screens, and I open up a brief on one screen, and I open up either the Bill of Exceptions or the transcript on the other screen. So as I go along and I read and I find a statement and then there's a citation to it, I go to the record. Yep, there's that citation right there. Lots of times, I look at the citation, I get back, look again, that is not what that says. So I just, I, I pulled out like three examples, <coughs> just typical things that we see. This first one, I apologize, it's a little hard to, it's a little bit hard to follow. Um, the case actually involved um, a defendant who was convicted of assault. Following the assault, later that day, he makes a phone call to the victim and he threatens her. She hears the conversation and so do the investigating officers who are at her house at the time. Several months go by and shortly before trial, the defendant makes another phone call to the victim and again threatens her. So at trial, both phone conversations come in, and the defendant's counsel objects, saying, well, the second, second phone call never should have come in because that violates Rule 404. It's evidence of prior bad acts. Court disagreed. It allowed the evidence in. They appealed from the county court to the district court. The district court affirmed. Well, the district court does a written order when it sits as an appellate court, and so in preparing the appellant's brief, <coughs> The appellant sets forth his argument, he cites um, to the court's order, which he's supposed to do, and which is very helpful. So this is the actual excerpt from the brief. Um, the district court stated any error in admitting the 404 evidence was harmless because it was, quote, cumulative and relatively insignificant. T20. T20, go to T20, yep, that's the court's order, and there it is. Basically says, quote, cumulative and relatively insignificant. The appellant goes on, quotes again from the order, had the evidence of appellant's subsequent bad acts been excluded by the jury, been excluded, the jury still would have heard the victim and the officer's testimony regarding appellant's threatening phone calls to the victim following the assault. And that's the first phone call. T21, yep, sure enough, there's the quote. Then this is the argument that the appellant made. However, the district court then stated later in its order, quote, such evidence was properly admitted by the county court without objection and provided much stronger evidence that the appellant called and made threatening statements to the victim, evincing his guilty conscience following the assault. The appellant takes those two statements and then says, this evidence, this evidence, the subsequent phone calls is the later one, is what the appellant is calling this evidence, cannot be both cumulative and relatively insignificant while also being stronger evidence evincing the guilty conscience. Well, I agree. I mean, something's either insignificant or, or if, it, if it's stronger evidence, those two are inconsistent with each other. But the actual court's order, which of course is in the transcript, says this. The record indicates that the victim and the officer all testified that appellant called and threatened the victim May 15, 2017, shortly after the assault. That's phone call number one. Such evidence was properly admitted by the county court without objection and provided a much stronger evidence that the appellant called and made threatening statements to the victim of his guilty conscience. 
So the such evidence that the court obviously was referring to was the first phone call, not the second phone call. So there is no inconsistency in the court's order. Misleading? I don't know. Definitely confusing for us. Here's an example of a second of, of another one from a brief. Um, the excerpt. Upon exiting the apartment, the victim fell down the steps and sustained injuries from her fall. Bracket, sight, and bracket. Well, I've now come to surmise that the reason that that sight in a bracket was put there is because it was a placeholder for the attorney that he was going to go back and find that actual testimony so he could pinpoint it for us in the bill. <laughs> Later in the brief, uh, it says, um, there was testimony from the examining nurse that the alleged victim fell down the steep stairs leading to the appellant's second floor apartment depicted in exhibits 27 and 28, a very plausible explanation for the appearance of any bruising found upon the alleged victim. Okay, well, they don't give us up above the specific site to the record, but now they've kind of indicated to me that, oh, it must be in the examining nurse's testimony. Okay, so we have the trial testimony. Fortunately, it's electronic. We have a search function. I can type in steps, stairs, fall. When we don't find it, I can actually go back and read all the pages of the nurse's testimony, and this is what I find. She had a small abrasion, I believe it was on her left palm, and she said she thought she remembered falling. I'm not sure there's anything there that talks about falling down the steps, or that the examining nurse said that she fell down the steep steps. The third example, um, Another statement from a brief, this, uh, this one actually involves the termination of parental rights. Um, it had to do with drug testing of the mother. While the mother was dismissed from testing for lack of engagement, the tests, complete, the tests the mother completed were, for the most part, negative for both drug and alcohol. They give us a citation, Exhibit 27, and then um, some reference to the Bill of Exceptions to the actual testimony. Exhibit 27 turns out to be a chart of all of the drug tests that were offered um, to the mother. They show that 60 drug tests were offered, 16 were successful, and 44 were unsuccessful. The citation to the record does support that the mother was discharged from services by the drug, by the drug company, um, basically because she failed to attend those testing and that that was considered an unsuccessful discharge. So for any of you who do anything with drug testing, you know if you don't show up, it's a pos presum it's presumed positive. So basically what we have are 44 unsuccessful tests, which are presumed positive, and 16 that were negative. Not sure that the tests completed were, for the most part, negative for both drugs and alcohol. I'm not saying that making these representations in your brief are going to subject you to um, sanctions. Are you going to get turned into the Council for Discipline? I don't know. Probably not. I can tell you from my own personal practice, though, when I start to work on a case and I have the appellants and the appellees briefed, I very, very seldom look at the cover page. So I don't really pay any attention to who the author attorney is. But as I get further into the brief and I come up with more of these types of inconsistencies, I almost always go back to the first page of the brief to see who wrote it. I just think it says a lot for you as an attorney and your credibility and your integrity, whether you technically run afoul of the rules or not, you have a lot on the line. And our jurisdiction is relatively small. We see the same people over and over again, whether it be in the trial courts, whether it's you all practicing with other attorneys. You, you know those attorneys, the ones that you know you can trust and the ones that you ask for everything in writing. Um, I don't think the 
reports are very much different in that respect. Once, once you have proven your trustworthiness and your integrity, we're a little more apt to believe you. And on the other hand, once you have proven to us over and over again that we probably really do need to go look back and make sure what you say is actually contained in the record, probably the less we believe you. Those examples I gave you are just, I mean, they're just examples that we see that come across our desk on a lot of the cases that we deal with on a daily basis. The next few things are actual reported cases. The first one, fastball sports versus metropolitan entertainment. And this wasn't a disciplinary action. This was actually um, just a motion for sanctions that the defendant filed against the plaintiff. What happened in this case was the plaintiff's attorney attached to his complaint a document which he purported to be an agreement between the parties. He made representations in his complaint that there was an agreement between the parties and attached to it as a copy of that agreement. Well, as it turns out, what the attorney had done was he had deleted from the attachment the words draft on that document. He had also printed on each page of the document his client's agent's initials, and he signed his client's name to the last page on the acceptance. So the defendant's attorney calls him out on it, files a motion for sanction, and asks the court to <coughs> dismiss the petition, the complaint, or to stay all discovery until they can have a hearing on it so that the attorney can explain that attachment. So they have the hearing, and the plaintiff's attorney is very forthright about it. He says, yes, I did remove the word draft. Yes, I did put the representative's initials on each page. And yes, I did sign my client's name to it. He also said, there has been absolutely no tampering, misrepresentations, or underhandedness of any kind, and defendant's motion is a red herring intended to mislead the court. Well, the court did not impose the sanctions that the defendant requested. Remember, he requested that either the complaint be stricken or that there be a hearing and give the plaintiff an opportunity to explain it. They had the hearing, the attorney explained it, and then he asked for leave to file an amended complaint in which he attached the document in its original form. Our review was abuse of discretion. I mean, no abuse of discretion by the trial court. We affirmed the decision not to impose sanctions. Not to impose sanctions. I don't know if there was a subsequent filing with the um, Council of Discipline or not. The next case, however, does arise from the Council of Discipline. Um, in that case, it involves some misrepresentations um, about whether the attorney had the authority to settle a case. It was kind of the, I'm in the middle of settling it, I have some authority for my client. It was the delay based on a representation that it was all going to be settled. He had no authority from his client to actually settle the case. And the Council of Discipline recommended, and the Supreme Court affirmed, um, a three month suspension. Another one from 2017, this one involves a guardianship. Um, for those of you who are involved in guardianships, you know that there are annual filings that need to be made with the court. Contained within those annual filings, you have to advise the court how often you visit your ward, if they're in a facility, how often you check in the facility, things of that nature. So the representations that were made in those annual reports um, set forth the number of times he had visited the ward, when he didn't visit the ward, he actually had all these conversations with the facility. Truth of the matter was, those representations were based upon things that he claimed he did between 2010 and 2015. He had not spoken to, nor made any contact with the facility that the ward was in since 2009. 
This wasn't the only violation of which he was accused. Um, he was ultimately suspended from the practice of law for, for one year and required to do some continuing legal education before reinstating. Um, the final reported case, and I'm not going to uh, steal thunder from subsequent uh, presentations that are going to be made. Um, I just wanted to mention this one. It's from last year. Uh, it was a false representation made to the probate court having to do with uh, tax forms. Um, and then there were also some misrepresentations uh, in, in uh, calculating the inheritance tax worksheet. The attorney was suspended from the practice of law for a minimum of two years, followed by two years of probation. What you do and whether it results in sanctions is kind of dependent upon to whom you do it and whether they're actually going to report you for it. And I think that's pretty much how the council looks at and gets their information. Um, but it does, doesn't mean that you shouldn't still always be forthright. This is a quote that I had found in the Washington Lawyer. Without honesty and integrity, an attorney jeopardizes all credibility with tribunals and opposing parties, imperils clients' goals, and reduces the public's trust. I guess my final words to you would be, you have to live with what you do, and you have to be able to look yourself in the face the night before bed when you look in the mirror. Sometimes taking the high road, almost always taking the high road, is the better route. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I'm happy to pass it on to our next speaker. All right, just getting situated. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I admit that it's a little daunting. I'm used to speaking to students in smaller numbers, but it's uh, great to be here amongst uh, this, this group today. Um, today, I have chosen to speak about uh, attorney's fees. Now, I'm sure this is not the most exciting topic that you've ever wanted to hear about, but you know, time and again, we see cases where there are lawyers who are getting in trouble because of issues concerning attorney's fees. And so, it, to me, it made some sense that we might spend some time um, addressing these issues today. So, let's see if I can make this work. Hello, let's see. Hmm. Maybe I'm a little unsure about that. Maybe I need to adjust to teach them how to think of it. Oh, it's now working. Okay, good. This, this way works. Um, just as an overview, the things I plan to sort of cover today, first of all, I talk a little bit about the ethical duty that lawyers have to make sure that our fees are reasonable. Um, I'll talk a little bit briefly about the reasonableness factors that are included in the rule. And then I will focus on some of the problem areas where lawyers get into trouble with their fees, with certain specific contexts, different practices or mistakes that are made that result in um, findings of unreasonable fees. Um, I'll also spend a little bit of time talking about um, investment in a client at, uh, in lieu of a fee or as a fee or receiving property um, for a fee, which involves other ethical considerations and other requirements. So we'll spend a moment on that topic. And then finally, um, assuming that there's some time, we will talk a little bit about um, contingent fees and some of the cases in that area and some of the special considerations when it comes to contingent fees. The, um, the whoops, wrong direction, there we go, how about that? Um, the, the rule is, and by the way, you ought to realize that the Nebraska rules are based on the ABA model rules. 
So the ABA model rule is 1.5, the Nebraska rule is 3-501.5. So the, the, um, under the Nebraska rule, you can read the language here, we have a duty, um, a lawyer has a duty not to um, ask for um, or collect an unreasonable fee or unreasonable expenses. This requirement obviously is to uh, protect clients and protect the public from being taken advantage of, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, very uh, important, of course. Uh, also, maybe there's a secondary um, aspect of this, and it helps us protect the profession so that the public uh, um, doesn't think of us as sharks, right? Or think of us in negative ways. And, and so it protects the integrity of the, of the profession. The um, Nebraska court, the, the Nebraska rule uh, includes eight factors that we consider when we're trying to determine whether or not a fee is reasonable. Uh, and, uh, and these factors are used, you know, they're, they're from the model rules, so nearly every jurisdiction is using these same factors. Um, and these are very much like the factors we had even before 2005. Uh, um, in fact, they may be exactly the same, I can't remember, but they're close, if not the same as what we had before 2005. The, um, so, so these factors guide a court in determining, and lawyers, in determining whether or not a fee would be considered and deemed reasonable. So I've tried to highlight in yellow, I know there's a lot going on in, in uh, the text of this, um, those different considerations. So a court can look at the time and labor required uh, uh, to handle the matter, the novelty and difficulty of the matter, and the skill required to handle the matter um, under the first factor. It can also consider whether or not accepting the matter precluded the lawyer from um, accepting other employment. Uh, um, that's a relevant factor. It can consider whether or not uh, what the fee that is customarily charged in the area, in the locality, uh, would have been. Uh, uh, so that's, that is relevant. Four, the amount that was involved in the dispute or the matter, and the results that were obtained. So if you did a bang up job, that can be relevant. And um, also how significant the matter was may, ma may matter also. Um, number five, the time limitations imposed by the client or other circumstances. So if this is like oh my gosh, the deadline is coming, it has to be done immediately, you need to drop everything and um, handle my matter, well, that might, that might support a higher fee. The, um, uh, number six, the nature and length of the professional relationship with the client. Um, have I represented the client in the past? Do we have an ongoing relationship? That may have some relevance. And um, number seven, experience, reputation, and ability of the lawyer performing services. Uh, um, is this, you know, a very highly regarded lawyer, a, a highly respected, who can command maybe a higher fee, uh, perhaps? And then finally, um, whether or not the fee is fixed or contingent. So these are the factors that the rule tells us a court or a lawyer ought to consider when they're determining whether or not a fee is reasonable. Now, um, interestingly, and I'll show you on the next slide, a quote from the Nebraska Supreme Court just this year. Uh, um, these reasonableness factors, they're not really just for lawyer discipline cases, because they're used, this is actually a workers' compensation case involving um, an award of fees and determining what the appropriate fee would be. And the Supreme Court says, and this is not new, it's been going on for a long time, that the courts should consider, when they're deciding what a reasonable fee is, they should consider the rule of professional responsibility and its eight, um, and the eight factors in that rule. So this is significant, and it also is significant in um, cases where lawyers are bringing an action to recover their fee against their clients, uh, the former client, and uh, the courts will look to these eight reasonableness factors to determine whether or not uh, uh, what the lawyers are seeking is reasonable. Um, the, there are lots of ways, then, that fees may not be, uh, may be found to be unreasonable. Lots of different things can happen. And there are um, cases strewn all over the country that uh, uh, address these sorts of issues. 
I often rely on, I have a book with me, the, um, it's an ABA publication that's the annotated rules, the annotated model rules, which have um, lots of cases attached uh, or in the notes following the rules. That are very, it's a very helpful resource for uh, research on these types of issues. Well, um, one, one thing that will help uh, constitute an unreasonable fee is if the lawyer has engaged in some illegality by imposing the fee um, or in seeking the fee. And I um, have a few examples here. So first of all, uh, there are cases where the lawyer attempts to charge a fee that's in excess of statutory caps. For example, um, a, 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 a Colorado case from 2000 involved a workers' compensation matter where the attorney fee was in excess of a statutory minimum of 20% that was allowed in Colorado. Well, that's an unreasonable fee. You exceeded what the statute allowed. Um, another workers' compensation case from West Virginia, claimants cannot waive statutory limit on attorney's fees, nor may lawyer request a waiver. So even if the client agrees to it, you can't circumvent what the statute allows. Um, different context, um, this is from Indiana in 2006, a case. A, a, fee agree a, free, a fee agreement attempting to circumvent a statutory cap in a medical malpractice case was held to be an unreasonable fee. Um, so there are, uh, you know, statutes that, that they matter, they're enforced, and when the fee violates the statute, it's held to be an unreasonable fee in these cases. Um, another consideration, a fee in violation, not of a cap necessarily, but of any statutory provision. There is a probate case from Wisconsin from uh, 1993 that involved um, a probate lawyer who was seeking 4% of the gross value of the estate's inventory, um, and that contravened a fee statute in the um, state that said that you can't um, base the fee upon the estate's value. So another example of an illegal fee that was unreasonable. Um, illegally taking money from an estate's checking account uh, charging compound interest before charges were billed. And that's actually an Iowa case, and there's a statute that said, apparently you can't do such a thing. Uh, um, and so that was held to be. And then uh, finally you'll see attempting to trade legal services for sexual favors, uh, a violation of this rule and other rules as well. Um, not too surprising. So, uh, another problem that, that we see in some of these fee cases that involve unreasonable fees is we see this problem of what they call bill padding, padding bills, or double billing. And I, I have listed here a number of examples from cases. Uh, the first example that I list, well actually before I get into the examples, let me mention this. There have been like surveys done. I think there's a survey from about a decade ago, or a little over a decade ago, um, and the survey indicated that many lawyers self-reported that they sometimes fudged a little on their billings. And also they reported that they believed that other lawyers did the same. So it uh, was an indication that uh, this is a serious issue or a serious problem for us. Well, um, the first example I, I, I note here is a, a, a case, there are actually several cases, um, involving uh, lawyers who have plagiarized other people's briefs and then charged a whole bunch of money for it. And in the particular cases, you know, plagiarism is one thing, that's an ethical issue, um, but that wasn't really the issue in these cases. The real issue was that you charged the client for lots of hours of work and you took verbatim pages from other briefs so there's almost no original content. And the court said, there's no way that you could have justified putting in that many hours or, or uh, billing for that many hours when all you did was lift text from another source. Uh, um, the same as uh, another case involved a treatise where the lawyer had lifted text verbatim from a treatise, put it in a brief, and the court said, unreasonable fee, there's no way that uh, you could have uh, 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 use that much time to just take someone else's language and, and put it in a brief. 
inflated billing entries. This is, um, we, you know, we can see examples of this, um, not infrequently, but there, uh, a Colorado case um, involving inflated billing where uh, clients do things like, I think I put it here in the next, uh, the next tab, uh, um, the, the lawyer says, I'll give my, says to the client, I'll give you a 15% discount, and then they turn around and just uh, inflate their hours so that they get to the point where they wanted to be originally anyway. Well, unreasonable fee, and also deceptive, so there's lots of times these problems run together. In fact, in, in many of these cases, when the lawyer ends up being disciplined for an unreasonable fee, often um, there are other violations as well. It's uh, uh, not just an unreasonable fee, there are other issues that are happening. Um, another uh, example that I put here that I thought was interesting and, and maybe important for us is a, um, an opinion, it's an ethics opinion from Oregon that tells us that a lawyer who goes to court for a docket call and spends one hour there and actually responds to four different cases, represents clients for four different cases in the same docket call, the lawyer only can bill one hour. Uh, um, you can't bill one hour to each client. Only one hour total can be billed for that, um, for that time. Um, double billing clients for travel, another issue. And the ABA actually has an opinion on this, which is from clear back in 1993, so maybe this is old news for people, but the, the opinion um, addresses this scenario where a person is flying um, <coughs> on, 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 for a client's matter to make an appearance somewhere. So they're, they're um, flying to another city, and on the flight, they sit down and they do work on a separate client's matter. Um, so they're uh, uh, and then they bill the client for whom the travel was done for those hours, and then they also bill the client uh, uh, for whom they did the work while sitting on the airplane. Well, the ABA opinion says, and I think this is um, generally accepted, is that that's not appropriate to do that. Um, you only spent three hours on that airplane, you can only bill three hours to somebody. Now, there may be some flexibility who it gets billed to, but you only get to bill three hours, you cannot bill six. Um, there's also this issue that sometimes was referred to as sort of value billing, where lawyers said, well, um, my agreement is to bill on an hourly basis, but uh, um, I uh, had done work for a client previously, lots of research on this very same topic, and I was able to use that research, so uh, it was unnecessary for me to do a whole bunch of work for this particular client, so they would justify um, boosting the bill and representing hours that they had not actually spent on the matter. Well, the, again, the ABA opinion is clear, and I think the, uh, other courts agree that that's inappropriate to do that because the agreement was I will bill you hourly, and I don't get to bill you for hours that I spent for another client that I billed them for, um, and claim that that was for your matter, even though the client definitely benefits from the time it was spent in the earlier work and in the earlier representation. So, you know, it's, we only get to bill um, an hour for an hour, and we only get to bill the hours that we actually spend. There are some very egregious stories of lawyers who uh, um, build more than 24 hours in a day, for example. In fact, I'll give you a couple of examples. Let's see. Uh, a West Virginia, this is 2017, a West Virginia lawyer billed the state more, um, um, for more than 24 hours a day on two different occasions and for more than 20 hours on some other days. And the lawyer was suspended for two years um, for billing, uh, for charging an unreasonable fee. Um, another case from 2005 involved a Connecticut lawyer who billed, brace yourselves, 94 hours on a single day and it was actually, um, and it involved payments uh, from the government, which meant that it was a very serious crime, and that person was indicted, and I think they settled in a civil action by paying back over a million dollars. Um, and it wasn't just that day, this was a practice that had been happening. Um, so, 
there are stories like this that, uh, that are out there. Now, admittedly, sometimes we have poor record keeping, which results in lawyers doing things like this. So they'll say, well, you know, I don't know when that happened, but and they just write it down on the same day or on another day. Um, and it, it's a result of poor record keeping. But you know, that's not helpful, that's not helpful. So what, what the message is, is if there's a record keeping problem, fix it and keep good records. Uh, um, but you cannot uh, bill in this fashion. You've gotta be able to stand behind uh, the bills that you, that you present. Well, another issue that we can consider or, or that has come up, and, and this may make some, some of us uncomfortable, I don't know exactly what the practices are now, but um, billing increments. Now it used to be, I believe, long ago that we billed in fairly large increments sometimes, and um, meaning people might bill for in, in a half hour increment or in 20 minute increments, things like that. Um, well, billing in large increments is viewed uh, by many courts as unreasonable fees, uh, billing unreasonable fees. And as I put here, some courts have even questioned billing in quarter hour increments as unreasonable fees. Uh, a phone call, a short phone call, writing down 15 minutes, um, they suggest is not appropriate. Uh, um, and so that is something to consider. Now those are not discipline cases, and I'm not suggesting that, and, and I think that, um, that lots of places probably still do um, bill in quarter hours, but it does raise a question. Um, at least. Another problem that happens, of course, is failure to do work or doing minimal work. Uh, um, if we take money and we don't end up doing the work, you got to refund the fees. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. If we uh, take a bunch of money and we, do, uh, we, we don't do all the work that we should, uh, um, then that's also problematic. And again, we might need to refund part of the fees. Um, there is a case uh, in Nebraska that I've noted here, and, and the lawyer um, had a flat fee in the matter and took um, a $1,500 flat fee. This was an estate-related matter. Took $1,500 as a non-refundable flat fee. Uh, um, and then, the, um, uh, uh, then shortly thereafter, the client sent another $500 and the, the lawyer didn't know what the $500 was for and just put it in his business account. Um, and then shortly thereafter, the lawyer was suspended for some other violations, ethical violations, and so could not do the work. Um, the client demanded the money back, and the, the $500 the lawyer sent back, but said that the $1,500 was an unrefundable, a non-refundable flat fee, and the court said, this was a violation of Rule 1.12, well, 3-501.5, um, as an unreasonable fee. And the uh, court added an additional six months suspension to this attorney's um, already existing suspension on that basis. Um, lawyers, uh, uh, another interesting case I found involved a lawyer who had a conflict of interest. So in this case, the lawyer was uh, uh, handling a criminal defense matter and um, he started the representation but then discovered that his partner um, was representing a co-defendant in the same matter. And so the lawyer had a conflict and could not continue in the representation. The lawyer recognized that and passed the case off to another lawyer from a different firm and that lawyer accepted the case. Uh, um, and what happened was the original lawyer had um, agreed to do, handle the case for $15,000. And the new lawyer agreed to handle the case for $10,000. So the old lawyer gave $10,000 to the new lawyer, and the new lawyer did handle the case. Well, um, after the case was over, the defendant said, hey, what happened to my money here? Figured out that the new lawyer had only, been charged, had only charged and was only paid $10,000. He said, where's the other five? And the original lawyer said, well, um, I was consulting the new lawyer, and so uh, um, based on that consulting uh, that I was doing, I was able to keep the $5,000. Well, first of all, it was a problem because if the lawyer is conflicted, you cannot consult um, on that case. 
Uh, um, but secondly, the court said that he really didn't do any consulting anyway. He did no work. And so that was an unreasonable fee and a violation of, of the rule. Um, and that, um, let's see, that case ended up in a suspension of 60 days. The, um, of course, sometimes fees will be held to be unreasonable because a poor job was done. So um, it may be that $3,000 was appropriate, uh, uh, an appropriate fee, a reasonable fee, to do this trust work, to create a certain trust. But where the lawyer uh, um, did a very bad job and, and you know, didn't do it right, then the court, uh, in this particular case, said, uh, that's an unreasonable fee that you charged for um, bad work. So it's another, and there are lots of cases involving shoddy work where the court says unreasonable to charge those kinds of fees for bad work. The, um, uh, um, there's another issue about work that benefits the lawyer and not the client, and this was interesting to me. Uh, um, there are, there's a case or some cases that show that uh, billing your time to do your timesheets uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, said that's really for the benefit of the lawyer. That should be overhead, and it's an unreasonable fee to charge for that. Um, responding to ethics complaints. So either where the client has accused their lawyer of being unethical, you can't charge them fees for that for defending yourself in that matter. Um, or where opposing party in a matter has um, uh, uh, filed a grievance against the lawyer, the lawyer could not charge their client for defending um, that grievance either. Um, and then finally, and this probably won't surprise anyone, but in an action to pursue fees against the client, I can't charge the client for that. So that's an unreasonable fee as well. Um, doing too much work can result in a finding of unreasonable fees. So, and we can, we can understand that. Doing unnecessary work, um, to boost the number of billable hours, or filing unnecessary or improper filings. And I, and I cite a case here from Nebraska not too long ago that um, involved an immigration matter where the lawyer was filing a number of, of things for the client, but one of the things they filed was a petition for which um, the client clearly was unqualified. I mean, on its face, the client was not qualified uh, to prevail um, in, in that uh, immigration matter, and the lawyer charged and filed that um, filing, and the court said, well, that would be an, that's an example of an unreasonable fee. So that was inappropriate. Um, let's see. Next, I wanted to, oh, well, I, I should say I'm, I'm doing too much work, which was the last one. Lots of cases where um, the court says this is just too many hours for what what work was done. There are many many cases like that. Um, one case from New Hampshire involved estimated fees were thirty thousand, actual fee was sixty four thousand, and the court found it was a probate matter. Um, the court found that um, the um, Way too many hours have been spent. They spent 225 hours in the matter, or actually more than that, 225 hours writing a brief, 85 hours preparing for oral arguments, and the court said typically it would take 30 to 75 hours total for all of that work. So an unreasonable fee because of excess, excessive work that was done. Um, remedial work. Uh, uh, we cannot charge our clients for time necessary due to the lawyer's inexperience. So, and this is a quote from a Maryland case that just suggests, um, of course you get paid for research that you do on, on difficult issues and things, but if it's just general education or background research, then you shouldn't charge the client um, for that. Um, too many lawyers. This involves a situation where lots of lawyers are working on the same case and they're duplicating their efforts. And, and so where the court looks at the matter and says, um, based on the work that was done, there was way too much consulting and, and hours written down for consultations, and um, uh, uh, too many lawyers assigned to the case worked the matter. 
Um, charging lawyer, lawyer rates for non-lawyer work. A and we, we see these, well, the first one I list is charging for clerical tasks, like making photocopies, um, delivering documents to the opposing party, uh, um, going to the courthouse to file a document, things that could be done by runners or that could be done by paralegals or secretaries or, or other staff. Uh, um, that may impact a, a finding on a reasonable fee. Area, in the area of conservatorships or guardian work or trustees, we see many cases where lawyers are charging fees, legal fees, legal rates, for things that are, are not really legal work at all. And examples, some of the examples are quite egregious. Um, things like, let me see, I'll give you the examples for here. Attending, this is an Iowa case, charging hourly rate for attending Ward's birthday party <laughs> and discussing the Ward's toiletry needs. So that was an unreasonable fee. Um, another case, and this is a, a 2013 case from Iowa, lawyers suspended for charging for conservative ship legal rates for tasks that should have been done by a guardian, including shopping, transporting to medical appointments, purchasing and delivering gifts for others, and attending birthday parties. So we got the birthday parties again. But the point is, if it's that kind of work, you shouldn't be charging legal rates for that. Um, either you hire someone to do it at a lower rate. In fact, in that case, they said, you could have paid someone for $15 an hour to do those things, instead of charging 100 or $150 an hour or whatever it was. Um, and then finally, I found this one interesting too. There's a case from Mississippi that, that involves a, a firm that had a JD, someone who graduated from law school, um, working, and they were charging that uh, um, lawyer, that person's um, uh, uh, work as at, at an attorney rate. But it was before they had bar results, so they weren't actually licensed yet. And, and the, the the court said. They're a law clerk. Until they're licensed, they're a law clerk, and that's law clerk work. That is not legal work, and you can't charge uh, a legal uh, a lawyer's rate for a law clerk law clerk's work. Um, client agreements are not conclusive. I, I mentioned here, and what I mean by this is, it doesn't matter that the client's okay with it. Um, it may still be that it's an unreasonable. And it doesn't matter that maybe the client originally was okay with it and it was in the written fee agreement. Uh, the court is still going to scrutinize the fee um, for reasonableness under the rule. And I um, cite a um, Nebraska case where they say that. Um, we're concerned not only about what the agreement says, but we're concerned about whether or not the fee is reasonable. Now I do have a little compare site here at the end, which I found fascinating. The case I found it really interesting, partly because Kuhn, in this case, he's um, been a defendant in a lot of copyright cases that I've uh, studied through the years. So I was interested to see this case. This is a situation where Kuhn was in a divorce. Um, he's a famous artist, and uh, in New York, famous artist. He was in a divorce and custody, custody battle over his child, and his spouse was a high-profile political person and from Italy, actually, and, they, and she had a place in Rome and a place in New York City. And Coons hired um, Paul Weiss Rifkin to handle his legal matter. And he told them things like, leave no stone unturned, and you know, do everything that, that you can um, in, in this matter. And they did everything they could, apparently, uh, um, in, uh, to the tune of $3.9 million. Um, now, it was over some years, and it did involve having to go to Italy you know, a number of times to handle some matters, so it's not as maybe as shocking as it might be. But nonetheless, that's a lot of money um, in a custody matter. And, and so Coons paid some, but then he wasn't paying, and so they were suing to get the fee. And, the, and, his, uh, and Coons said, you know, this is an unreasonable fee. And the court said, well, you know, we're not going to come in and save you from the agreement you made, and they didn't find it to be an unreasonable fee. So I just put that as a compare case to some of this other, some of the other cases. Uh, another case, and this is a Nebraska case, involved a lawyer who 
uh, um, in an employment matter, agreed to represent the client for $100 an hour at that rate. And then later, the court awarded attorney's fees um, in this matter, um, but the client had already paid the lawyer. Um, the attorneys, the, the lawyer got the money that the court had awarded for attorney's fees and kept it, and then tried to, to convince the client to, to renegotiate the fee up to his standard fee, which was higher than $100 an hour. And the client refused and demanded the money um, that the court had awarded. And the lawyer didn't return the money. It was about 11880 bucks, And um, the client uh, filed the bar complaint. And the court, the, the court said that it was an unreasonable fee, keeping that money, um, resulted in an unreasonable fee, and also improperly withholding the client's funds, and that it was unreasonable to withhold the funds in order to pressure the client to renegotiate the fee. So, um, another interesting example of the way that fees can be um, unreasonable. Well, um, I, I, we know that sometimes, but, uh, I don't know how common it is in our community, but, but we know that Sometimes clients will make a, arrangements with us to pay for their fees in non-traditional ways or in other ways. Particularly if we have new startups, for example, or a new joint venture or a new startup company, they might say to the lawyer, uh, um, hey, we can't afford to pay you, but would you take um, a share in our company or take some, some amount of stock or enter into some agreement that is based upon uh, future revenues? And, and so, uh, this, this happens and, is, and can be acceptable, but um, when we have payment of fee in the form of property, it is often viewed as a business <coughs> transaction with the client. And when it's a business transaction with the client, then we have to look not only at Rule 1.5, but we need to also look at Rule 1.8, which deals, Rule 1.8a specifically, which deals with um, um, uh, business dealings, business transactions between the client and the attorney. And we have to comply with both rules. And, and as you will see in a moment, Rule 1.8 has some very specific requirements that we have to uh, um, uh, meet in order for the transaction to be um, ethical. Um, and now I have acquiring stock in a client. Uh, if that's the case, you have to satisfy Rule 1.8a. Um, and that is according to an ABA formal ethics opinion, as well as cases. There are cases that also hold the same. Um, and I'm, I'm told that there's a pending Nebraska case that involves um, issues like this. Um, it, is, it was argued in October, but the case um, is still pending in the opinion. It hasn't been issued yet. So that's something to watch for if you're interested in that area. Well, Rule 1.8. Again, this is the model rule, but it's the same in the, this is the Nebraska language, but it is uh, from the model rule. A, a, a lawyer shall not enter into a business transaction with the client or knowingly acquire an ownership, possessory security, or other pecuniary interest adverse to a client unless, and then one, um, and then I'll just sort of paraphrase, the transaction has to be fair and reasonable. So this is objectively fair and reasonable to the client. Uh, um, and it needs to be disclosed in writing in a manner that can be understood by the client. So that's one requirement. Second, the client needs to be advised in writing that it would be a good idea to, to consult with another attorney on the matter. And then um, finally, the, the client has to give informed consent in writing uh, um, and, and acknowledging not only the essential terms of the deal, but also the lawyer's role in the transaction. So we have some significant requirements that are involved. We gotta make sure we have this all written and, and regardless of the writing part, the court has to deem that the transaction was fair and reasonable. Uh, so it's a significant, uh, significant thing for us to be conscious of and aware of. Reasonableness of these kinds of arrangements are typically viewed prospectively. In other words, we're gonna look at the time the agreement was made, was it reasonable or not, 
as opposed to after it turns out it was a great deal and, and the lawyer is, is benefiting uh, significantly. So usually we look prospectively, not retroactively, or retrospectively. And there is a Nebraska case that's supportive. It doesn't say those words, but it, it's supportive of that view. Uh, now I just have here, but um, there is at least one case and, and maybe others where courts do look back and say, well, the circumstances have changed, and they'll look back and, and sometimes um, invalidate or end those obligations. And so the one case that I'm thinking of, I think it was from Washington State, involved um, a new joint venture, um, and it had to do with a mall or something like that, and it, it ended up, the lawyer did a little bit of work getting it started, and then it ended up being very successful. 30 years later, they were still paying based on um, annual revenues. They were still paying the lawyer 30 years later based on this agreement. And the court said, uh, 30 years is long enough. It's an unreasonable fee. And so that was, um, so I'm just, put that out there as something to be mindful of. <coughs> well, this applies not only to fees and fee arrangements, but all, um, the reasonableness requirement also applies to expenses. And, um, we probably appreciate already that you can't charge your client for uh, normal overhead, office overhead, like office space, malpractice insurance costs, utilities. That's not on the client. Uh, um, uh, you may charge for copying costs and telephone charges and, and things like that, but only if it's reasonable and if the client agreed in advance or if they didn't agree in advance, only if it's reasonable and it, it reflects the costs, the actual costs to the lawyer. In other words, the fax machine, the copy machine, the telephone, these should not be profit-making um, centers, right, in the, um, in, the, in the deal. And that is straight from the comment to the, to the rule. All right, the last couple things I wanted to mention uh, before my time is through is uh, contingent fees. So of course contingent fees are, are perfectly acceptable and appropriate in many cases, um, but there are some special requirements in Rule 1.5 that address contingent fees. Uh, and one of the requirements is that uh, we're reminded by lots of Nebraska cases and other cases that contingent fees are subject to the reasonableness requirement. So just because it's a contingency fee case doesn't mean that we're not going to look beyond the contract. Um, and I'll share with you some cases um, like that in a minute. But uh, second, um, under the rule, contingent fee agreements must be in writing. So these have to be written agreements. Um, whereas other fee agreements don't always have to be in writing, but they, they do need to be clearly communicated and preferably quote. Preferably, how about that? Uh, preferably in writing. Um, the, uh, it's been a long day and a long week, how about that? So, um, and then we know from the rule that uh, contingent fees are not permitted in criminal cases and they're not permitted in certain domestic relation matters. And, and those are specifically um, talked about in the rule. Well, the, the four cases that I, I just listed here for us to spend a moment thinking about are, um, the first case is, is Miller in, uh, from 1999. Um, in, the, in, the, in that case, there was a woman and her son, and the, the son had serious health issues. And so the, the woman uh, approaches the attorney to handle some matters uh, for them, and the attorney um, told the mother that he would handle it for a 20% contingency fee. Uh, um, when the son came in to actually sign the documentation, the um, engagement letter, the, the letter said it was um, one third, the contingency fee was one third of any settlement, and it was 40% um, after a suit was filed. So if a suit was filed, it would be 40%. And the son questioned that and said, wait a minute, I thought it was 20%. And the lawyer said, 
oh yeah, that's that is what the understanding is, but this is just a formality, and and so the client allegedly the son went ahead and signed signed the agreement. Uh, um, well, the the issue in the matter involved a double payment to a hospital of some very significant medical bills, uh, um, and the um, it was clear it was a double payment and that the client was entitled to the money, no question about it, and. The, uh, and sure enough, the lawyer, uh, in contact with the hospital's lawyers, worked it out, and they, the hospital agreed that they would send the money, the double payment, back um, to the lawyer, um, ultimately. And when the hospital had agreed with the lawyer, the same day that the hospital agreed with the lawyer that they would be sending the money back, that they had worked it out, and they would send the money back, the lawyer went down and filed a federal lawsuit um, to recover the money. And did not tell the clients about any of that. Didn't tell them they filed, and didn't tell them that the hospital had agreed that they'd be refunding the money. Um, the hospital then sent the check to the lawyer. The lawyer kept ninety-seven thousand dollars of it, which was forty percent of the double pay, the double billing, and sent the rest to the client. And the client objected. Um, the um, and, and so, uh, and then we of course had a disciplinary uh, proceeding that was brought. Well, the court said, first of all, that um, the fee can't be justified just because it's a contingency fee agreement. And um, moreover, so it made very clear that contingency fee arrangements are still going to be reviewed for reasonableness. Um, it also, of course, had concerns that the fee agreement did not necessarily reflect what the actual agreement was. And so they had a problem with that because there's deception involved in that, if true. Um, but furthermore, the court said that uh, this was an unreasonable fee because the, uh, uh, the lawyer had put in very little time on the matter. Um, it was a clear-cut case. It did not require, they basically went through the eight factors. Um, it was a clear-cut case. Um, it did not require any special skill or experience, um, no big exigencies, and so the court said the fee was clearly excessive. And actually, the court in that case disbarred the lawyer. Um, so that was um, an interesting case. The next case, the Kirby case, uh, is an older case, but it, it, it was a case to recover attorney's fees, uh, where the attorney was sued the, the client for attorney's fees. And the court, um, in that case, there was a, it, it involved um, um, a case with uh, real property, and there was a farm at issue, and ownership of the farm. The lawyer said that the contingency fee agreement was 30%, and the client said that they had not understood what a contingency fee was, and, and moreover, no amount was mentioned, um, no percentage was mentioned. And the court uh, uh, said, well, hey, that's a problem. This is under the old rule when it wasn't required that you write it down. But they said you still needed to prove by clear and convincing evidence what the agreement was. And so the court said it was not clear what the agreement was. Um, and that they could not recover uh, the, the, the full 30% uh, contingency fee that they were claiming. And then they reiterated that the court has the power the authority, the inherent authority to regulate the bar and, and inquire into the reasonableness of contingency fee agreements. Next case is the Houghton O'Brien case. Oh, and I think I'm about out of time, so actually I think we'll just skip to the last case, which is a, uh, the Garrison case. And in that case, um, it was a personal injury case. Uh, um, the lawyer, again, failed to communicate the basis of the fee. And so this is from 2017, when the rule was very clear, if you're going to have a contingency fee, you've got to do it in writing. Well, the lawyer didn't do it in writing, and um, did not uh, adequately uh, satisfy the rule, and didn't have an arrange a real clear understanding with the client, even an oral understanding with what the fee was. And so the court said, this is a violation of rule one point uh, of, of the rule. And ordered a but suspended the lawyer for 90 days and had some probation. But it, there were other problems beyond what I, I just told you. 
So I um, want to make sure that that is clear. Well, with that, I think I need to finish so we can have a break. But uh, thank you very much for your attention today. Settle up at the end of the case, make sure you have an accounting that's in writing that you can provide to the client so that the client sees exactly what your fee is, what your costs are, and so on. The second thing is it relates to if any of you have done work with insurance companies or big corporations, you've probably run into billing guidelines. And that that makes all of these things that Craig talked about in terms of common law ethics rules contractual. And they, there's often much stricter in, in, than what the common law would otherwise provide. If you've got a problem with billing guidelines, what I would recommend that you do is if, if you think something's not going to be covered that you think needs to be done in your discretion as a lawyer, talk to your client contact about that before you do it. And then when you put the time on the billing sheet, say per authorization of whoever your client contact is so that you've got a fighting chance when that auditing firm takes a look at your bill and denies that charge because normally it's not paid, you can go back to them with an appeal and say, well, client contact authorize that. And so it, it requires a little bit more work on your part. It requires the client contact to, to sign off on it. But oftentimes they will because they understand the case. They understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. The problem is the auditors, they've separated them so they don't they know nothing about the case. And so they can be the bad cop and the client contact can be the good cop and they can say, well you don't have to talk to the auditor about the, the billing. But if you do that per, per the authorization or per request of the client contact, you'll have a better chance with your billing guidelines challenge on appeal. So having said that, let's take our break and then come back, back in about 10 minutes and we'll finish up. Thank you. Start off, first of all, by 
telling you, I'm, as you probably know, the President of the State Bar this year. One of the things that, as President, you have to do, or you get the privilege of doing, is uh, testifying before the le legislature on bills that are out there that are of interest to lawyers. So I had the opportunity to do that before the Judiciary Committee this year. Steve Lathrop is an Omaha Bar Association member, a Creighton Law grad from my, from my law school class, as a matter of fact. And he's chair of the Judiciary Committee. I will tell you, he's doing a great job down there. Um, one of the things that I uh, testified on was uh, judicial salaries and also getting a, a, a judge for Douglas County. Uh, and in the course of testifying about judicial salaries, I was talking about my experience, not just in Nebraska, but in, with judges all over the country. And I, I said, I thought, and, and I really believe this, that uh, Nebraska judges were as good of judges as I'd run into anywhere in the country. There was, you may not be surprised to hear this, but there was one member of the Judiciary Committee that wanted to take issue with that. <laughs> uh, Senator Chambers called me on that. And, and he, you know, do you, are you really saying that Nebraska judges are as good as other judges throughout the country? If, and I said, yes. And he said, well, if you could live anywhere else and practice anywhere else in the country, would you uh, still pick Nebraska and Nebraska judges? And I said, yes, I would. So I wanted to get that out there to let everybody know that I'm pro-Nebraska judges. Uh, <laughs> because the focus of the presentation today is a little bit more judge-heavy uh, than it is lawyer-heavy in terms of the conduct we're looking at. Uh, I didn't want anybody to get the wrong impression here, much less anybody in Lincoln to get the wrong impression. All right, so we'll talk, start off talking about attorney discipline decisions. We've got a couple that I think just bear mentioning, uh, not because they're anything necessarily earth-shattering, but some of the co commentary that the court had uh, and some of the things that they looked at are uh, interesting. The first one is the Tremblay case. The only, case, the only issue in this case was the sanction. There's no question about the fact that the, the, the uh, violation occurred for failing to file a tax return. And so the opinion was addressing what the appropriate uh, sanction should be. Uh, the, the facts were that over a million dollars was not reported on the lawyer's income tax return. And uh, it was obviously a very substantial amount. <laughs> so that was, that was the, the thing that got him in trouble to begin with. Uh, the court, in a per curiam opinion, uh, handed down the discipline. And so, not, not all of you may be familiar with per, per curiam opinions, but what that means is no judge signs it. There, typically, you see at the beginning of the court opinion, it's written by such and such judge, or and then at the end, you may see the dissenting judges. A per curiam opinion, you don't know who wrote it. It's the, it's the product of the entire court. Uh, and, and so, in some of these cases where they're somewhat sensitive, or where the court has taken some action that uh, lawyers may disagree with, uh, you, might, you're, you tend to see these per, per curiam opinions. Uh, the court said in this case, there was no bright line rule that a felony conviction creates any presumption in favor of disbarment, uh, as, it, as for uh, commingling or misappropriating trust funds. And the lawyer was focusing on the conduct. He want, didn't want the court to focus on the felony conviction. He wanted the court to focus on the conduct to suggest that maybe it wasn't that bad that he didn't report over a million dollars worth of income. Uh, the court said, I wanted it very clear, that there's no question here that the failure to file tax returns is serious and it's a crime of moral, ter ter moral turpitude. So the, 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 uh, the violation was clear here in this case. There were some mitigating factors, though, and that's what I wanted to really talk about with this case. There were some letters submitted, and in any dis uh, disciplinary pr proceeding that there is, whether it be uh, in, in the court is thinking about taking action, a, a trial court in terms of sanctions, uh, or the Supreme Court or the Council for Discipline, it's, it's not unusual at all for the lawyer to request that letters be submitted on his behalf that talk about his good character or her adherence to the ethics rules in the past and so on. And so there were letters submitted as you might expect in this case. But the referee, when he wrote up his report, when he analyzed uh, the facts and recommended discipline, he wrote up his report, the referee didn't mention these letters. <coughs> well, what happened then was that the lawyer didn't take, any, the lawyer that was being disciplined and his attorney didn't take issue with the fact that these letters weren't mentioned in the referee's report. They were in the record, they were there, it's just the referee didn't bother to mention them because they weren't necessarily relevant to the referee's decision making. 
But the court said because there's no exception made to the referee's finding of fact, the court may consider the referee's ruling to be final and conclusive. Now, the key word there is may. The court doesn't have to take the referee's conclusions as final. The court could go back and could look at these letters, even though, because they were in the record, even though they weren't part of the referee's decision. But instead, the court found that the referee's report was conclusive and was final and refused to consider any of the letters submitted on the lawyer's behalf. Well, the referee's decision or recommendation was 18 months suspension. The court hit the referee with a three-year suspension. So it doubled what the referee's suspension was. My thought is, if you're going to double the referee, double the suspension of the referee and make this lawyer sit out for three years for arguably bad conduct, then you ought to at least be willing to look at the letters of recommendation or the letters that have been submitted on his behalf. And it seemed to me it was a trap for the lawyer because the lawyer was in a situation where it wasn't like he had to take specific issue with what the referee said because the referee didn't say he was rejecting these lawyers or the letters weren't any good. He just didn't mention them. So it was a bit of a trap for the lawyer because once he got to the point where he wanted to try to save something on the sanction side and have the court consider these, the court was unwilling to do so. And so that just kind of makes you cringe a little bit that when the court is going to take the suspension and double it, that the court wouldn't even go so far as to consider these letters. So something to be aware of in the future should that issue hopefully never will come up for any of you. On the Nimmer case, this case was a lawyer violated disciplinary rules involving the trust account. And as many of you know, the trust account has always been the third rail of ethics when it comes to lawyers and discipline. It has been the single area where the court has been the most consistent in terms of wanting to make sure that lawyers do the right thing when it comes to their trust accounts. And that means not just you don't steal from your client or you don't take the money from the client, but it's also proper accounting procedures, making sure that funds aren't commingled. And this was a case where commingling was a big issue. And we'll see the facts here in a second. But for example, this lawyer was using his trust account to deposit a $10,000 loan from his mother. He was using it really as an operating account, notwithstanding the fact he had his own personal account. The referee recommended a one-year suspension and two years of supervised probation. The lawyer challenged both the finding and the disciplinary action. And then you'll see in these disciplinary opinions, when they go through the mitigating factors, there's always a section on what's the lawyer's attitude. And the lawyer's attitude was listed or referenced by the court in this case as he was challenging the court's authority to discipline. And I think you'll see, maybe get some indication of where this case is going when the court made it an issue in this opinion that the lawyer was challenging their authority to regulate the conduct of lawyers in the state. It's not going to end well for this lawyer. The facts of the case were the lawyer wrote numerous checks out of his trust account for dog boarding, landscaping fees, and so on. He argued that the funds deposited were not his personal funds, but related funds of third parties, such as his mother and his daughter and other people that he was holding funds for. But nevertheless, they were used for his personal use. It's a conduct pattern that was hundreds of checks, thousands of dollars. I mean, there's references in this opinion to he paid his old PPD bill out of his trust account. He paid his Cox communication bill out of his trust account 20 times, 30 times. And so there was certainly plenty of conduct for the court to focus on. Again, it was a per curiam opinion, so we don't know which members of the court really wrote the opinion or signed off on it. But it made it very clear that trust accounts are something that need to be very much protected by lawyers. And the court was concerned that if you aren't watching out for commingling of funds and trust accounts, that you're going to have things happen that you hadn't planned on and there could be problems with the accounting. You need to be concerned about that. But the important thing is, this applies even when the client suffers no loss. So if you've got commingling, you've got a problem, even though the client has never been shorted, the client's never missed any funds, even though if you earmark those funds somehow in your trust account, if they've been commingling and the client has suffered no loss, you still have something more than a technical violation. And so commingling, the court noted, was one of the most frequent basis for disciplinary action. 
And it sounded a prophylactic warning in this case that commingling will not be tolerated. So the warning that I have for you <coughs> is that if you've got problems with your accounting, and you've got problems with your check ledger, if you've got problems with understanding what your trust account is in terms of money in, money out, and who those funds belong to, from whether it's one client or 10 clients, you need to get your house in order. You need to get that trust account in order so that if somebody walks in from the court, from the Council of Discipline and says, I want to uh, audit your trust account, you can pull out the checkbook and you can pull out the check ledger and show it to the auditor and say, here, I got no concerns, it's clear as day. Because if it's not clear as day, if it is, as, as the court says later on, uh, if it's not a situation where uh, you have sloppy, or if you have sloppy accounting, if you have misapplied funds, then that's going to stand out, and that's a violation, even if the client's not being uh, affected by it at all. One of the things I get to do occasionally is have lunch with the Chief Justice, and one of the things he said when we were talking about a, a, an attorney discipline case that is not here today and has been resolved for some quite some time, involving a lawyer that we talked about here, though, in the past, uh, he said, look, the biggest concern we as the court have is protecting the public from lawyers who are going to do things uh, either in terms of handling their case or handling their money that's going to injure the client. He said, the second thing we're concerned about is the reputation of the bar. And so that came through very clearly in this Nimmer case because the court was focusing on those prophylactic warnings and gave the, 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 the lawyer the understanding that what the court was saying was these are our priorities here in terms of what we're trying to do. So there, like I said, poor accounting procedures and sloppy office management, they're not excuses for mitigating circumstances. So if it's not crystal clear, if it's not clear as day, you need to get your trust account order, uh, trust account in order fast. And of course, the client, uh, no loss of the client is not a factor. So the court have repeatedly held that, as I mentioned, this is a third rail but it's not just a third rail when it comes to uh, stealing funds or having funds used by the attorney uh, without the consent. It's, it's a third rail when it comes to commingling of funds. And disbarment, the court has held, is appropriate when there's commingling. So remember, you, what the court's saying here is you can get disbarred even though the client hasn't lost any money if you've got sloppy enough accounting procedures in your trust account. And that's what they did with this lawyer. They disbarred him. So, the takeaways from these two cases are this. The court isn't going to hesitate to impose greater sanctions than recommended by the referee. If the referee says, I'm going to give you a year of suspension, don't rest on that laurel because you may be facing two years of suspension by the court if they think it's warranted. Second, the client doesn't have to be adversely affected by this uh, when you're talking about trust accounts. And so don't rest on that uh, uh, factor. And finally, Probably not a good idea to challenge the court's authority to regulate uh, lawyers. So, keeping with our theme of talking about judges, uh, this was a case from, I think, 2004. Uh, maybe it was 2014. Anyhow, it's, it's not necessarily fitting in the category that we have for my presentation over here, which is recent decisions in Iowa and Nebraska, recent ethics decisions. But this was a recent decision to me because I just found out about it a couple months ago, so I included it for your benefit. Uh, this judge and the public defender had an exchange of, of uh, opinions that I'm going to show you in the following video. I, I, I hope that the, uh, the sound comes through. If you don't, if you don't hear it clearly, uh, I'm going to play it one more time later on. So, but here's uh, the judge in Florida. Here, Mr. Rumble. Yes, sir. Two charges of assault and resisting. You have the public defender. Public defender, what do you want to do? Are they not? They have. I'm not waiting. He's not waiting. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? I'm not waiting. If you want to set up a trial, set up a trial. All right. If you want to set up a trial, set up a trial. I'm not waiting anyway. This is an you know, if I, had a right, I would throw it at you right now. You know, this Stop is a, pissing me off. Just sit down. I'll take care of it. I don't need your help. No, sit down. Well, I'm a public defender. I have a right to be here, and I have a right to. I said, to sit down. Clients. If you want to fight, let's go out back, and I'll just pick your ass. Ten seconds passes. 
Jesus and then we fast forward to this. <laughs> Judge walks back in to a round of applause. The judge says, well, he says, I'm an old man, you know, he was out of breath, but he was pretty happy with himself. Of course, the Florida Supreme Court thought differently about that. <laughs> and he was removed from the bench. Now, so, as we've seen in some of these other videos I've shown you over the years, there's other things going on in the video, other than just this uh, encounter between the, uh, the public defender and the court. And I'll just show you briefly what I was talking about. First of all, look at the defendant. Yes, sir. He stands at that podium the entire time. He's going to fight. He doesn't move. He's going to fight. 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 He's going
is on immunity cases. And so if you are representing a, a policeman, sheriff, a jailer, those types of positions, they have qualified immunity. And, be, and what that means is qualified immunity from suit, not from liability, not from damages, but from suit. And so what you'll see, typically courts will want to resolve the qualified immunity issue first, so that we, if the uh, public servant is not uh, liable in the case, or is, is, if the qualified immunity defense applies, they're out of the case quickly, and then the case proceeds in the merits with respect to anybody, everybody else. And so because the collateral order doctrine has been rejected in Nebraska by the Supreme Court, now we can't take these qualified immunity cases up where it's denied. We can't take them up to a, uh, on appeal in Nebraska, and that was made evident by the Bellevue Public Schools case later or, uh, late uh, last year. Again, they said no final order because we're not going to rely on the collateral order doctrine, which is, is different from the federal uh, courts. The federal courts say if you've got a qualified immunity issue, you can still go to the Eighth Circuit if, uh, if it's denied, if qualified immunity defense is denied, you can still take it up on an interlocutory basis. So there is a difference now between federal and state court. And what this is the biggest reason why you'll see these types of cases being removed from state court to federal court is so you've got a quick uh, route, route to the Eighth Circuit for qualified immunity appeals. But in any event, we see this happening again, this, this pattern of, in procuring cases where the court is overruling prior precedent. And in the Bellevue Public Schools case, it overruled the Store Visions case, which was an immunity case as well. So the court made it clear in that case that Heckman was not just a narrow holding. It's, it's, that whole concept in Heckman or in Richardson was directly at odds with our final order of jurisprudence. And so it read Heckman to, to govern all these cases. So that brings us to the Fiddler case, and this was another case from last year. And this is a situation where we see it occasionally where you've got an administrative dismissal. You have 270 days to move your case forward. If that doesn't happen, you've got uh, dismissal risk from the court. It's just as a matter of the computer spitting it out. And that's what happened in this case. This nursing home malpractice case, it was dismissed for lack of prosecution. And the lawyer representing the uh, plaintiff went in to see, uh, have the dismissal set aside and had the case reinstated. And courts aren't generally willing to do that. Uh, whether th th This issue wasn't wh whether the court should have set it aside or not. Uh, because there was a case that was previously decided called the Jarrett case that was a, it was a, a cow case. It was on all fours with, with the, this uh, Fiddler case where the case had been dismissed. The case, uh, administratively, the case was then reinstated, and then the, the uh, defendant who had the case reinstated against him took it up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court accepted it and said, yeah, uh, it was, it, it's, it's okay because ju the jury case was the prior case. It found the substantial right to be affected, and the dismissal <laughs> would have triggered a likely successful statute of limitations defense and subsequent refiling. So the only reason it really comes into play is if you've got the subsequent, this statute of limitation defense, that if the case is dismissed, then the, the plaintiff is at risk when they refile that they're going to not be able to proceed because somebody's going to come in with a motion to dismiss based on the statute of limitations. So that's really what's at issue here. And in the Fiddler case, that was at, at play, just as it, it, it was at play in the Jura case that preceded it. And so the, the lawyers representing Life Center can look at the case and say, well, we've got to, we've got to route to the Supreme Court, excuse me, right route to the Supreme Court here because there's a case on all fours where the same thing happened. It's the Jura case. we got a winner here. So again, how do you explain to your client when you've got precedent out there, you've got a dead bang winner, it's the same facts, it's the same situation, the same law, and the court, it goes up, and then the court says no, in a per curiam opinion, uh, that, yeah, Jared does support everything you're trying to do here, and Jared is in line with all that, but it focused on the wrong case. It was on the wrong action. It should be on the present case. And so, yeah, in that subsequent future lawsuit, that'd be a substantial right affected in, in that case. But that case isn't before us. It's just this case. And there isn't a substantial right being affected in this case. And so the court sided with the party, the plaintiff, who got the case reinstated. The court said, in a quote, it, it had a misdirected focus that caused it to answer the wrong question following the, final, the finding of a final order where none existed. So 
the, the, the misdirected focus was on that subsequent case in terms of how that would be handled and resolved by the statute of limitations for this. So again, I like to talk about this issue not because it's a procedural issue, but because it's a client relations issue. It's going to affect how you're perceived by your client. And one of the things that you're going to have to answer, and I'm sure the lawyer in this case had to answer, is why did the court not follow its precedent here? Why, why did we have a dead bang winner, and why did this then change to be a case that we lose and get our appeal dismissed? And if you're a lawyer, your response is, well, the court's focus was misdirected. <laughs> you know, does that make your client feel any better? I mean, obviously not. And so it's a situation where this adherence, this slavish adherence to the final order doctrine and upending all of these cases in Nebraska over time, I think does more harm to the integrity of the court's opinions in the past, even though there may have been a little judicial legislation there in terms of adopting the collateral order defense or that doctrine. Instead, instead of doing no harm and leaving things the way they were, the court has turned this area of the law on its ear. And it's, there's been no, no consideration given to legislative acquiescence, legislative acquiescence. It wasn't like the legislature was running into, to the end of the breach here to try to fix this problem, because it really wasn't a problem anyone thought existed. So anyhow, one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this up was the filler holder, it basically put everybody back where they were before, no substantial right, the appeal was dismissed, that was the holding. So we have lots of precedent overruled in these cases. And the reason why I think it's worthwhile to note is that the cheapest insurance policy that you can buy for malpractice in these cases is the filing fee from an appeal to, from the district court to the Supreme Court. And what do I mean by that? I mean that if you're in, if you have any doubt, rather than allow the 30 days to pass for an appeal when you think something's not a final order, rather than let that pass and then go to the end of the case and take it up on appeal and have the Supreme Court tell you, no, that was the final order, you should have appealed back then. You should write the check for 126 bucks, take it up on appeal. What will generally happen, the clerk's office is very good about looking at these cases to determine if they're final orders at the outset. And it's not at all unusual for the clerk's office and the Supreme Court within the first 45 days of that case being up on their docket to look at it and maybe have an order to show cause why it should not be dismissed if it's a lack of a final order or if it's a final order issue. And so it isn't like you're necessarily going to be tied up on appeal for a year and a half, especially if you're wrong and it's not a final order, but that $126 might be the best money you ever spent in terms of allowing you to sleep at night in terms of whether it's trying to decide is it a final order or not, particularly when you see what the court's doing with all the jurisprudence that's come in over the last 10 or 15 years in this area. All the cases have been overruled. You never know, are they going to overrule the next case that you're relying on as well? So that's why I thought it was worthwhile mentioning. Like I said, it's procedural, it's a bit arcane, but it's an area that's currently in flux and you just need to be aware of it. All right. As you know, I'm from Iowa. I'm a member of the Iowa State Bar Association. It's a great bar association. They have a law pact, and their law pact raises funds for their lobbying efforts through this law pact. So they had an idea, we're going to put this in the Iowa Lawyer magazine. We're going to sell t-shirts, and we'll sell t-shirts to fund our law pact efforts, which makes perfect sense. There's no problem with that. I support that. The t-shirt said, hate us until you need us. And then they have Cruella de Vil here in the picture on the t-shirt saying, Iowa lawyers, hate us until you need us. Well, first of all, why would anybody that's a lawyer want to create the impression that clients either should or do already hate us? Why would that be a good thing? And then it seems to me it's a little snarky. Hate us until you need us. And this Cruella de Vil here in the photograph is pointing to it, and she's winking. It's like, yeah, but when you need us, then we're really going to get you. We really got you then. That just strikes me as being snarky. And I know a lot of the people that run the Iowa State Bar Association, and I thought about picking up the phone and saying, guys, are you sure this is a good idea? And then I thought, no, because I would have nothing to say to make them feel good about any of this. So I just kept to myself until now. 
because I can share it with you. <laughs> Don't tell anybody over in Ireland I said that. <laughs> All right. Talk about West Virginia. Craig had mentioned a West Virginia case where some lawyers going 24 hours in a day, and this isn't about West Virginia lawyers as much as it is about West Virginia judges. Uh, there was a case back in 2002, and why I'm going back to the far will be evident in a minute, where we had coal companies fighting. One coal company got a verdict of $50 million against the other company. He was claiming he was driven out of business. There was a judicial election, and that's where I want you to stop initially, judicial election. I mean, we are so fortunate in, the, in Nebraska that we have the Merit System Plan, the Missouri Plan, where we have judicial nominating commissions, um, and we don't have to worry about judges being elected and the political pressures that are come to bear that come to bear in the, the expense that's attended to elections for judges. They're, they're tacky. But there are many states in the country that, that uh, have them, especially in the southeast and in the east. So in this judicial election, this Blankenship, who had the judgment entered against his company, spent $3 million, and his focus was we want to defeat a liberal judge who he thought would, would vote in favor of upholding this verdict. There was a con conservative lawyer by the name of Brent Benjamin, and he was elected instead of this judge. Now, uh, the case was still pending and, and uh, had got to the uh, West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals. It was now Justice Benjamin. He was uh, Cap Capricorn, who had the judgment entered in his behalf, moved to refuse him three different times, and three different times Benjamin said, no, I can be fair, I can be fair. And so, three years later, when the case, after it was argued and decided, or argued and briefed uh, in, in the West Virginia Supreme Court, Benjamin cast a critical vote, a tie-breaking vote, and a 3-2 decision that threw out the $50 million verdict against the guy who had spent $3 million trying to get him elected. Now, the, the, the case is a little bit more difficult than that, but uh, Capitol raised these due process objections and appealed, and so the, the appeal went then to the United States Supreme Court. It's one of the few disqualification cases, one of the few ethics cases of this nature that have ever been in the United States Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, well, because an interested party spent a lot of money, it had to have a disproportionate influence in this case, and so we're, we're going to overrule the, part of the lower courts, and we're going to say that Benjamin should have been disqualified. And that's what happened. They disqualified him. So why is it that Benjamin should have been disqualified? The court found he had no actual bias. It wasn't like he had demonstrated any uh, affinity or friendship with Blankenship or the Massey Coal Company who had the judgment entered against him. He had no control over how this money was spent because Matt, uh, uh, Blankenship was the one who was spending all the money. He gave uh, Benjamin a thousand bucks, and the rest of the money he gave to a, a, a pack. Uh, the rest of the two point nine some million dollars he gave to a pack to be spent on this election. But the court noted there was a possible appearance of impropriety here. It was thin, but it was there. It's thin because there was no demonstration of actual bias or friendship here or cronyism, and there was no control that Benjamin had. He was, it, was, it was out of his hands that this. this person was spending all this money to defeat his opponent. But ultimately, the court's opinion rested on the fact that the public could reasonably question his impartiality in light of this big donation that was made. And so that was the basis for the court's decision to, to get Benjamin out of the case. Now, facetiously, I will tell you what Blankenship should have done, the guy with all the money. He should have taken the, 50, or the three million, and he, he should have given it to foundations supporting the, uh, the liberal judge, he was ultimately trying to get defeated here, he would have guaranteed his re-election, but then according to the Supreme Court reasoning, if that's applicable here, he, he would have had to recuse himself. So it kind of vote getting this lawyer out through the back door. But we, I digress. So why am I telling you about this case? From 2009, why am I telling you? Well, first of all, I know Brent Benjamin. Uh, he was a local counsel for me back before he went on the bench, good lawyer, employment lawyer, uh, and I thought he was uh, he did a nice job. Then after he went on the bench, I had another case in West Virginia that is still pending there, where he wrote the decision which reversed the trial court win that I had uh, that was uh, on a motion to dismiss. And so I, I've seen him both as a lawyer and I've seen him as a judge, and while I don't agree with his decision in, in my case, 
he, he did a good job. I'm also telling you about this because it's interesting. There's a dis disqualification action in the U.S. Supreme Court. But also because then in 2016, after he had written the decision uh, opposing my client, the election took place, and he lost his seat to Judge Justice Elizabeth Walker. Okay? That proved to be fortuitous. Because in August of 2018, the West Virginia House of Delegates impeached the entire Supreme Court. Four out of five. <laughs> Imagine that happening here. I mean, we can't even begin to think of that happening in Nebraska. That the legislature would impeach our Supreme Court. But they did it in West Virginia. And it's a different environment there, obviously. But four out of five justices were impeached by the House of Delegates or the House of Representatives there. The first justice, Justice Lowry, was impeached for the reason that he spent $363,000 on renovating his office. Uh, must have been a real dump before he did it. Uh, then he put forty-two grand into an antique desk, and thirty-two grand into a suede leather couch, and then he took them home and put them in his office at home. Uh, then he lied about it, and then he used state vehicles for his personal use. And so this is just an example of what was going on. And, uh, Justice Robin Davis, well, she spent five hundred grand on office renovations. And then she also permitted some overpayments. Well, the other two justices, they didn't have that much on it. Workman was impeached for abuse of authority and overpaying the senior status judges. And Judge Justice Elizabeth Walker, who succeeded Benjamin, she was just nabbed on abuse of authority. So, just four out of five justices? Well, the fifth resigned before he could be impeached. <laughs> He pled guilty one count of felony wire fraud for his personal use of state the vehicle in a few car. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. This, I mean, uh, truth is stranger than fiction here. And again, just be glad we don't elect our judges in Nebraska. We may have judges that write per curiam opinions in Nebraska, but it's still a heck of a lot better than what we're seeing here. So, Justice Lowry, just to give you some background on him, he even wrote a book chronicling all the political corruption in West Virginia. It must have been a how-to manual. <laughs> uh, and so he was also convicted on numerous counts of uh, mail fraud and so on. So we now have an entirely new uh, West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals. Uh, and I, and I, that is, uh, that's the recent development as it relates to West Virginia. All right, fastest five minutes. We'll breeze through this as quickly as we can. Uh, this is my update. I'll give you just a little bit about that. 2% salary increase for judges. We think that's going to happen. Uh, that will, will apply to all the, all judges. Uh, LB309 was the increase of judges. That apparently is going to happen, or that bill either has passed or will pass, but they're going to push it back to 2020 because the county said, wait a second, it's one thing for the state to name a, or appoint a new judge. We've got to come up with deputy sheriffs, service security. We've got overhead. We've got to find an office for the court. Uh, in the Hall of Justice or wherever it's going to be with the new uh, construction of the juvenile facility. So uh, that's going to be delayed until 2020. Uh, you may have heard about the Bayless case if you do bankruptcy work or creditor's rights work. And basically in that case, the Court of Appeals, and J Judge Reedman has left so I can't ask her about this, but the uh, Court of Appeals said that if you file a suggestion in bankruptcy, that's a general appearance such that you are now on record as counsel in that case. And so that obviously causes a lot of problems for somebody who's not expecting to sit through a trial or participate in depositions or attend hearings on a case. All they did is file a suggestion of bankruptcy. And the hearing holding of that case is you've now entered an appearance. That also perhaps is a little difficult to explain to your client as to how that happened. I will tell you that there is a bill in the legislature that, that seeks to change that ruling. I don't know what the outcome of that one is at this time. So. How, this is a case, House Canary is a case in uh, San Antonio Federal Court, District Court. And it was a judge writing a status conference order. And so he's sending it out to the lawyers. And one of the things the judge wanted to emphasize was commenting on the civility uh, the lawyers should adhere to. And we've heard that before, and everybody agrees with that. That makes perfect sense. Um, but this judge laid it on a little bit thick. First, he invoked the Kumbaya defense. And he said, oh, look, I don't expect you to do Singer, hold hands and sing Kumbaya, but I, you know you need to be nice to each other and know acerbic shrillness. And I, you know, I, I know what shrillness is, and I know what being acerbic is. I don't know what acerbic shrillness is, but I guess it's one of those things like pornography, you know, when you see it. But in any event, this judge didn't want any of that, and so he says, if if that happens, I'll pull your pro hoc, or you'll sit in a timeout in the rotunda, <laughs> or 
Jeffrey was required to kiss each other on the lips in front of the animal with cameras for <laughs> And I think it's an example, again, where our focus is kind of on judges this time. It's kind of an example where the judge goes too far, where he's complaining about the lack of professionalism among lawyers, and then maybe just be a little too cute. He throws in this stuff about maybe the kumbaya was okay, but, you know, timeouts in the rotunda and kissing before the Alamo. It undermines the, the, the underlying purpose here, which I think is, look, judges should be professional, so should the lawyers. You can get the message across to lawyers without creating thing, uh, orders that people like me talk about in ethics seminars. So, uh, BCs or CCs. This is an issue that came up in an Alaska opinion, uh, ethics opinion. And I don't know if any, if any of you have ever done this, but it's a situation where you're sending a lawyer, uh, an email to the opposing counsel. And all I don't want to go through the hassle of sending my client another email where I've got to do four more clicks to get an email going. You know, I'll just copy him as a blind CC. Hopefully you haven't done that, and hopefully, or if you have, hopefully this case will get you to stop doing that, because it, it, nothing good can happen. If you've got a blank client and a blind CC, then if he reads it and he replies to all, then he's replying his privileged communications to the other side as well. And so, you know, you, if, if you have to point it out to him, Look, don't do this because you're blind CC. You're better off not giving them that warning, but just do a separate email where you forward, forward whatever communication you have with your client separately so that the opposing counsel is not a party to that same trans electronic transaction. The, the Alaska Bar Opinion also said, you know, this also could be a problem where opposing counsel replies back to everybody, and 4.2 says you can't communicate with the other side's counsel without their consent. So it could be that the lawyer wrote back and said, yeah, and by the way, so-and-so client, I really think you ought to take my settlement offer because you're going to lose the court. That could be an ethics violation there as well. But the bottom line here is that using the forwarding process in terms of to get a message to the client rather than blind CC is much safer. And the important holding here is the, court, the Alaska Bar is saying, if you blind copy somebody, it creates a foreseeable risk that the client would respond to all recipients. So it's a foreseeable risk if you do this. So you're exposing your client to a foreseeable risk, and if you're doing that, you're exposing yourself to an ethics violation. So what do we learn? First of all, the court's emphasis on protecting public and attorney discipline cases may result in strong penalties and stronger than originally suggested by the referees. Irrespective of stereo decisis, the court is not going to hesitate to overrule long-standing precedent if the circumstances warrant. That's what we have to live with at this point. We have to try to figure it out as we go and do the best we can, recognizing that that is always a possibility that stereo decisis may not maintain the day. And three, no matter how strong the attorney discipline and no matter the lack of adherence to precedent in the Nebraska courts, just be glad you don't think. <laughs> That's all I have for today. Come back and see us next week. Thank you.